this presentation. Um, uh, hi, everybody. Welcome. And I probably know a lot of you, so it's good to see you again, even though I can't see you. I'm going to be shutting off the camera to save the bandwidth at this end, but I'll, I'll turn it back on when it's time for the Q&A. So um, you won't see my lovely face in a moment. And I just have to change the audio, and we're all set to go. Okay, so put your whole self in, examining how emerging technologies will impact teaching and learning. During this presentation, I hope to convince you to put your whole self in and turn yourself around by learning about the powerful applications that are here today and coming tomorrow. I want you to be able to provide pedagogically sound lessons that embed emerging technologies meaningfully, as well as allowing for the unintended and spontaneous use of these applications. So since I've recently received my HP certification, hokey pokey that is, and since I will be providing you with lots of information that I want you to remember, and the research is clear that dancing has many benefits, such as these, if we were in person, I would be making you stand up and dance. Because all of these things can help you after you dance. But we can't really start out unless you want to stand up and do the hokey pokey where you are right now. But since this is a virtual presentation, we're going to watch a little of it from a few of my friends who you may recognize who have helped me out. Okay, so I assume some of you know some of those people, and you can online, you can watch the whole dance if you'd like to. <laughs> Feeling relaxed, invigorated, and vital from the benefits of dancing? Let's go. The NMC Horizon Report is put out each year. The panel of educators and technologists who investigate and come to consensus on the upcoming trends start off with about 50 important trends of techno in technology that could have an impact in schools. I've chosen some of these to get you excited about how you can use them now in this kind of state they're in and in the near future when they may be easier to use, more accessible, or more powerful to support teaching and learning. Wearable technology has become much more commonplace. You see users wearing glasses, jewelry, a backpack, or even items of clothing that embed technology. Wearable technologies can track sleep, movement, location, temperature, and can even keep a mobile device charged. We're familiar with the current crop of these items, like the Apple Watch, the Jawbone Fit, and an idea that I had a long time ago that someone else is actually trying to get to market is the Eero Smart Earrings, which track heart rate, calories, and activity levels. They even plan to allow you to embed their technology into a pair of earrings you already own. It was not as successful on Kickstarter, but I predict similar products soon show up. There's a new crop of devices called EEG devices, items that use brain waves and brain wave patterns to control the computer or provide some neurofeedback. There are plenty of items already available that do this. But I have seen this one in action. NeuroSky's MindWave Education is intended for the student market. MindWave Education turns a computer into a private tutor. The headset measures brainwave signals and monitors the attention level of students as they interact with math, reading, and memory and pattern recognition apps. Ten applica applications are included, ranging from fun entertainment to serious education, as well as a development kit to allow you to create your own applications for students to use. And for those that are gamers, there's also a consumer gaming version available also. Here's an example of one of the reports from the MindWave data app. The white line is the measure of the attention to task. The vertical lines mark the times when the problems were answered. So you can see this person's attention to task kind of went up and down while they were doing their math. Electrovibration is not new. It was actually discovered in 1954. It refers to the process that when a finger is dragged across a conductive insulated surface, 
and it creates an electrostatic force that results in a sticky, rubbery, bumpy, or vibrating sensation. Electrovibration has the potential to replace traditional touchscreen technology so the user can actually feel the content of what they are viewing. Disney research is heavily into the development of this technology. For education, it would allow deeper interaction with educational content and also act as an accessibility option for those with physical disabilities. Their video talks about accessing the rich spatial dimensionalities of the world through touch surfaces. So you're looking at someone feeling smoothness, pricky little pricky prickly prickly I can't even say that word, and the ridges through the touch surface. That was the pricky one was the pineapple. This process works by applying changes in voltage as the friction on the touch screen changes. And IBM gives us a view of what this might look like from our cell phone. The sample they talk about is buying a shirt online. Through vibration, as you draw your finger over the different shirts for sale, whether it be burlap, silk, cotton, or something else, the differing vibrations will let you feel the material of the shirt. Pretty nifty, huh? Kickstarter and Indiegogo are online sites where developers of new things create a prototype and try to raise money for the actual production of the item. One project is set to develop a glove that seems to work with the principles of electrovibration. There are 10 actuators distributed along the palm and the fingertips of glove one, which vibrate independently at different frequencies and intensities, reproducing accurate touch, touch sensations. And the glove one can be back starting at $199. The sample shown here, while controlling your hand near a fire on the screen, while wearing the glove, your hand gets hotter as you move it towards the flame. Your physical real hand gets hotter, obviously, but you don't burn yourself. Location intelligence provides content that is dynamically customized according to the user's location. This is possible because of the GPS that is built into the devices and the ability of the towers, the cell towers, to ensure accuracy of location. We're already pretty comfortable with this as we check Apple Maps to see the traffic up ahead, or we check into Foursquare to receive a coupon for the restaurant we just arrived to at, and find out on Facebook which one, which one of our friends are actually near to us. But what if there was indoor GPS in school buildings and items could be tagged or smart and be located via a mobile device? A student could have access to the floor plan of a building to help them get around. In another scenario, in a science lab, a student might only have access to the location of items that were appropriate to his or her skill level with that piece of equipment. But I like the idea about using this technology in the grocery store. I could program it to only send me to items that are six points or less on the Weight Watchers point scale. Those of you that know what that is are laughing. Those of you that don't, it's okay. It's funny. Natural user interfaces allow us to interact with devices using natural movements and gestures. On the consumer side, the Nintendo Wii and the Xbox Kinect are examples of natural video gaming. However, there are other ways this technology is being used as the basis for real-world applications. These are shots from a medical application using Kinect called Gesture as the interface in the operating room. It solved the problem of the surgeon having to scrub out to take a look at an x-ray and allows him, through moving his hands, to rotate the 3D version of the x-ray while actually in the middle of the surgery. So they used an out-of-the-box gaming device, Connect, to create this. Pretty nifty. Many of us were early adopters, and we bought into an educational version of a natural user interface device called Leap Motion. You can see it's sitting in front of his keyboard. It's about the size of a pack of gum. And this USB device attaches to the computer via USB and acts as the sensor for use of your hands and fingers as you use the supplied educational software. It's only a start, but it really does promise to be a useful and engaging technology for schools as more educational applications are developed. And perhaps a mobile tablet device becomes available also. Here are clips from one of my favorite educational apps for Leap Motion.
you take apart the skull, rotate, so it doesn't have to be a skull, it could be anything. But everything is in 3D. And all you do is your hand, you're certain, you're pointing your fingers, you're closing your hands, you're putting your thumb up and down, and that's how that works. Leap Motion is part of another project called Tactum. So Leap Motion was created to do what you just saw. But Tactum took it to do something different. Tactum is an augmented modeling tool that lets you design 3D printed wearables directly on your body. It uses depth sensing and projection mapping to detect and display touch gestures on the skin. A person can simply touch, poke, rub, or pinch the geometry projected onto their arms to customize ready-to-print, ready-to-wear forms. Watch. So that's projected on the body. She's decided that's what she wants. Goes to the 3D printer. It's exported. And there it is. Pretty nifty, huh? Altspace is a startup company that wants you to put on a set of Oculus Rift VR goggles, and right away you're in a room with other robots, who are people, from anywhere else in the world. I assume you interact by moving your head. They really never did say, but let's take a look. This is a uh, virtual collaboration at its best. And we all used to do this with in Second Life, but this is, you're totally immersed with the VR goggles on. I don't know why some people don't have arms. There are starting to be mobile device apps that allow students to manipulate objects. One is called Explain 3D, where students can zoom in, zoom out, and rotate animations in 360 degrees. Again, these things are all in their beginning stages, so you have to think about the possibilities for the future. This includes simple machines, space items, and simulations dealing with electricity, transport, and tools. This particular app is available for iOS, Android, and Windows Mobile OS. It shows you a little information about the four-stroke engine. You can rotate it to see all the components of it also. All this on your tablet, which is pretty amazing. One Kickstarter project called Hollis can combine digital items and allow them to be easily shared and interacted with. The entry cost for a backer for this one is a bit steep, $650. It's a tabletop holographic display for the home or the classroom. Families can play games, collaborate, learn, and even holographically video conference. There's a holograph of dad. Okay, the next one is speech-to-speech -speech translation. And that's a combination of the capabilities of speech recognition, language translation, and speech synthesis. Right now, we have text-to-speech translation tools readily available. This one also does a form of speech-to-speech. -speech. So this is the app with the worst icon, but anyway, just, just get by the icon. The speech-free app instantly translates text into any of 72 languages and pronounces the tr translation for you. It also remembers previously in tr previous translations you've done and you don't have to have the internet replay, you don't have the internet present to replay them. So if you get all your questions out of the way when you're in a Wi-Fi environment, you can then make sure you have them when you're at the bus stop or you're trying to find the bathroom or the supermarket or whatever. All right, again, totally on your phone, which is pretty cool. However, true speech-to-speech -speech translation is actually now available in Skype. It translates back and forth in real time and also provides a written transcript of the conversation. Anyone can sign up for the beta program 
but now actually I think it's out for everybody. First, you select your friend, you toggle the translator on, you select your friend's spoken language, and then the written language. As you and your friends speak, it's translated in your headphones as well as in the chat. All right, toggle it on, she writes English, writes Spanish, speaks Spanish. So you're hearing her speak in Spanish, you're seeing, you're hearing her speak in Spanish, it translates into English in your ears and also in the, in the uh, transcript. I love this. This is called Motion Savvy. And Motion Savvy Uni uses the camera on a mobile device and that same leap motion, that thing that was about the size of a stick of gum, uses their engine to translate the user signing into spoken English and captures voice response and turns them into text for the person holding the device. Let's watch. Hello. My name is Alex. What's your name? Nice to meet you, Alex. I'm Jerry. It's pretty amazing. And this started out as a Kickstarter project. Um, and now it's available on the market. It was a lot cheaper when it was a Kickstarter project, but for anyone that um, that needs this kind of device, it's unbelievable. Virtual assistants have been around since at least 1987. Here's one that was planned, the Apple Knowledge Navigator, but it never came to fruition. And of course, we now have mobile voice interaction in Siri and other voice-activated helpers that allow us to control the functions of the phone and get general information. However, panelists at a mobilized conference talked about the movement from assistant to butler. So we think of Siri as an assistant. What about if Siri was a butler, where the user no longer needs to push a button to ask for help, but the information appears proactively on the screen of the device? Just kind of think about what Rosie or Mr. Carson takes care of, and you'll understand. There was a Kickstarter project recently that was for a real assistant. Well, kind of real. The personal robot was offered at $1,195. Let's watch a little bit of what it was planned to do. Artificial intelligence personal robot. She's your welcome friend at any hour. Good morning, Thomas. Time to get up. Good morning. It seems like you had a good night's sleep. Eight full hours and a good resting heart rate. Thank you. You're meeting with Jane, is it 9.30? I put the coffee on. She can interface with household devices. And she's also a personal stylist. What do you think? Why don't you try the blue tie with it? Good idea. She's your world-class office assistant, using artificial intelligence algorithms to analyze data quickly and efficiently. We a marketing campaign on the Upper East Side of New York. What do you think about that neighborhood? This neighborhood has a very promising outlook for this campaign with 25,000 housing units. Also, 82% of people living there have a college degree. I think that's the right one for us. Sorry to interrupt, guys. Thomas has a lunch date with Chloe in 15 minutes. She just posted a bunch of photos on Facebook about her trip to New York. Thank you. Kind of scary, huh? Well, you never knew. Syndication tools started out by making publishing platforms such as blogs fully accessible via RSS and a newsreader such as the now defunct Google Reader or the one most of us use now, Feedly. However, the next phase is the linking of these platforms together to produce new combinations and types of content via a turnkey tool like IFTTT, if this then that, which has the ability to create recipes. If you don't use this product, you need to use this product. It's unbelievable. So for instance, you can make all the tools do what we want them to do. For instance, if I make a reminder, it gets sent to my OneNote. Or if I get a text message, it, gets, it used to get sent to Google Glass. If I text, it goes to OneNote. And if I tweet, then it goes to 
Google Drive. I The reason I have it go to Google Drive is then I have all my tweets available and I can look back to see what I've provided to other people. Um, people build these recipes. There's now one for, there's recipes now for the Amazon Echo, which I have to try, but there's all kinds of tools that can be on either side of the recipe and you can edit them to do what you want. So if you want your, your task reminders to go to Evernote, you can do that. If you want it to go to some other um, app, as long as it's in there, you can do it. In addition to students using these syndication tools to manage their own information, in the near future, it will become commonplace for students to promote their own content creations using these tools, and they will know how to interpret the statistics to make sure that their content gets to their intended audience. So that's coming also. Next thing is open licensing. While current copyright and intellectual property laws focus on restricting use of materials, authors are beginning to explore new models that center on enabling use while still protecting the academic value of a publication and their, their ownership. These approaches make it clear which rights are enabled for various uses and smooths the way for others to access and use someone else's work. Creative Commons is an online project that allows users to determine how their work can be used ahead of time. They tell you ahead of time how it can be used. And these are the rights that a user can apply to their work. They always say you have to give attribution. They can tell you you can change it or, or not change it. That's the no derivative work. If you change it, I can tell you you may use my work, you may change it, but you also have to let someone do the same thing with yours, and that's the share alike. And I can tell you it can be used commercially or non-commercially. Now, all of, Trump's all of this is asking the creator if you can use their item for something, something that you want to use it for. You can always ask a person if it says non-commercial, if you want to put it in a book, you explain why, and they might say, well, that's fine, or they might say, yes, you may, but you have to pay me. So, um, again, asking a person trumps any Creative Commons license. So this is what a Creative Commons license looks like. So in this one, the creator allows the user to share it as is, use it non-commercially, modify it, and the user has to apply the same license if they change it to their new creation for others. So how do students go about finding these Creative Commons licensed items, these items that already have permission for them to use in various ways? There's a couple of very easy ways. The big three search engines have recently made it very easy to find Creative Commons licensed images. The options are actually all located in the same place in each of them. In Google Images, after you do a search, you, you see a drop down now and it says search tools and right below that it says labeled for reuse and it tells you not filtered by license means there's no Creative Commons license. Labeled for reuse with modification, labeled for reuse, labeled for non-commercial reuse with modification, labeled for non-commercial reuse. As you check various ones of those, your, your pool of images that are allowed to just get smaller and smaller, but guess what? You had a million, a million pictures to begin with, and now all of a sudden you only have 500 to choose from. That's okay. You're going to find something that you can use. In Flickr, after you conduct a search, you already see Creative Commons menu right on the menu bar, and there is, say, as soon as you click Creative Commons, your pool gets smaller, and if you want to use it commercially, it would get smaller, or if you want modification allowed, it would also get smaller. In Bing, after you limit your search to images, all of a sudden you see a license menu link with all those choices. Now, public domain is things that are out of copyright or have been produced by uh, a U.S. government for our purposes, and the rest are all um, Creative Commons licenses. The only more person that says Creative Commons is Flickr. If you're using uh, Google Drive and they're using the Google research tools, when you do a search for an image, you actually can see an option for searching only Creative Commons licensed images. It says free to use, share, or modify, even commercially. All right. I think an important thing for our students to internalize protection of intellectual property is to Creative Commons license any original or edited content that they post online. It's a simple process, doesn't cost any money, and can help them understand that respect for intellectual property is an integral part of this open licensing process. If people's intellectual property can't be protected, they're not going to put anything out there. 
So you can see how easy it is to allow commercial use, allow modification, the jurisdiction of your license, and additional information. What it is, attribution name, attribute work to a particular URL, and more permissions. And the more permissions could be, if you want to use this a different way, please contact me at whatever. And that produces what we saw before. The next one is virtual and remote laboratories. And they reflect a movement among educational institutions to make the equipment and elements of a physical science lab more accessible to students via the web, usually 24-7. So virtual labs are web applications that emulate the operation of real labs and enable students to practice in a safe environment before using real physical components or going into the field. All right. So some of these virtual labs now have reporting templates which can provide feedback to the teacher as to how the student progressed. All right. Remote labs, on the other hand, provide a virtual interface to a real physical lab. Students that don't have high caliber equipment at their school can run experiments and do lab work online. Students can view what goes on via a webcam that's at the other end. Of course, these remote labs could also allow students to conduct experiments that might be a little too dangerous to do in person. And in the future, I assume, there will be real-time virtual collaboration allowed in these labs. So you can have your own lab table. And there's questions about it. And then they work their way through the activity. So we've got to enter some distances now between 15 and 90 millimeters. And 90. Uh, how long do we want to do it for? Uh, probably um, three seconds each, and we'd like to do it um, three times. So it's now running the experiment. They can um, get the webcam and have a look at it. And the wheel's spinning down the bottom, if your eyes are quick. You'll do the readings, and then you'll see the this gear here rise up some distance, and it'll take another set of readings. Moving up now. You probably wouldn't want to be doing that in your high school lab. Collaborative networks is the next one I want to talk about. We all have personal learning networks and work collaboratively in near time and know that collaborative networks are important. These social networks will just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. How do you tame them? How do you use them to benefit you in your role as a teacher, in a school, in a district, in a city, in a state, in a country, on a continent, and on the planet? Aaron Fulkerson penned an article a few years ago about the future of collaborative networks in the business world. He talked about the differing goals between social networks and collaborative networks. I'm going to let you read. I think the easy access to video conferencing has moved education from the social networks closer to those collaborative network goals and will continue to do so. We have seen MOOCs for teachers and some for students, and they truly meet the criteria for a distributive collaborative network with a purpose, a participatory culture, and the ability to form and reform groups based on a purpose. I hope to see this type of environment become more popular in middle and secondary school in support of teaching and learning. Next up is information visualization. Information visualization is the graphical representation of technical, often complex data that's designed to be understood quickly and easily by the layperson. We usually call them infographics. A well-designed infographic can and illuminate facts buried in a research report or explain a detailed concept very easily with clarity and simplicity. I've always liked this easy to understand infographic about infographics. Infographics are data, sorted, arranged, and presented visually. For teaching and learning, the studies of infographics covers a number of valuable skills related to data analysis, design thinking, and the contextual inquiry-based research, not to mention the technical capabilities required to carry out ideas using creative software. The ability to visualize information is quickly becoming a new discipline in education. 
here is a quick overview. I hope this plays for you. is visual data analysis. And this is visual analytics. It's a way for people to explore and understand data sets of any size. They can move through the data via any path, asking questions, and also keeping a history of what they have searched for. They can see patterns and structures even in the most complex visual presentations. We have usually used this type of analytics in schools to determine student progress and high-level patterns. But dealing with visual analytics is something we need our students to become familiar with. Data literacy, though, is not just manipulating data. It's about applying the right filters to get the data one needs and deciding which visualization provides the most coherent view of the data. Students must be able to read, interpret, and evaluate information. They must be able to analyze, interpret, and evaluate statistics. And they must be able to gather, assess, process, manipulate, summarize, and communicate data. These three skills together collectively comprise data literacy. Andrew Churches of Ed Origami has created a data analysis rubric which can help you develop assessments for students in this area. Okay, rubrics, if you find a really good rubric, it's a very good way to design backward and design your lesson or unit to the rubric. I was able to get a license for Tableau via their Tableau for Teaching program. They have some sample data sets in the software, and it's simple to change the view of the data to meet your needs. These images show the same data presented differently, a skill our students should be familiar with, too. Okay, what's the best way to showcase the data so that the person looking at it can understand it? Augmented reality. Many teachers and students are using augmented reality via tablets in the classroom. Augmented reality is simply defined as the layering of information over 3D space. As Terry Height describes on his Teach Thought site, point your device's camera at something that the app recognizes and it will generate a 3D animation or a video superimposed over whatever is on your camera's screen. 
the effect makes the computer-generated item appear like it's really there. The Two Guys in Some iPad site provides a ton of examples of how students are both using AR to learn from teacher-created projects and how students are developing their own augmented reality projects. Here are just a couple of them. And Chris Byerly from South Carolina has curated almost 40 apps and tools for the use of augmented reality in the classroom. If you look through these, I'm sure you've used some of them yourself. I love Star Walk. When I go out in the mornings when it's still dark, I just hold it up and it superimposes everything right on the sky for me. Not just the stars, but all the constellations, all the history, everything. This is one student discovering what the layer app can do from can do from avenues the world school in New York City. Just watch his face. First time he sees it. It's the kind of expression that we want to see on every student's face. It's playing music, that's why he was kind of moving to it. One question that was asked of the NMC Horizon Report group of experts was, what trends do you expect to have a significant impact on the ways in which K-12 approaches our core missions of teaching, learning, and creative inquiry? They gave some trends that were provided, but the team could, could also add their own. I wanted to share some of the trends that were on the list and added by the team members in the 2015 report. So, to Accelerating ed tech adoption over the next one to two years, rethink how schools work, shift to deeper learning approaches. Three to five years, use of collaborative learning approaches, our trends, and students moving from consumers to creators. And five plus years, use of hybrid learning designs and the rise of STEAM learning, right, STEM with the arts. And here are some of the challenges that were presented in the report. I felt that any one of these would make a great topic for a PLC or study group at your school or district. So they had solvable, difficult, and wicked. And of course, most people look forward to the important developments in educational technology for K-12 and when they should be widely adopted. All right, makerspaces and BYOD, pretty much already here. 3D printed, printing rapid prototyping, on its way, adaptive learning technologies, and badges and microcredit and wearable technology. Now this whole panel comes together and everyone has to, they give us all these things to think about. We find websites and find experts and peep things we know about and we fill in and then everybody looks at it and then we come to consensus for the 12 top ones and then finally down to these six. I don't agree with all of these but that's okay. It's consensus. So to conclude, in the past we've always talked about the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Because of the new technologies and trends, and changes in teaching and learning. We've now moved to collaboration, creativity, communication, and critical thinking in the four C's. But what we're going to be moving to, I think, is personalized, programmable, predictive, and participatory as the four P's. I hope I gave you some things to think about and plan for as you come up with new ways of embedding these trends in as we move forward. And when seem things seem overwhelming, Remember to keep calm and do the hokey pokey. All right, I'm going to come back to you now. Share my webcam, change right to this to the electronics headset. Okay. Oops, I can't find my webcam, sorry. Okay, if anyone would like to type in any questions for Kathy, we've got just a few minutes left here within the hour. So just type them in that text box there, and uh, we'll sit here for a few minutes and wait for any questions. Kathy could answer those for you. We'll, 
or the four P's is one of the questions. Uh, programmable, participatory, and now you're going to get me right. <laughs> not a trick question. Uh, not a trick question. Programmable, participatory, I'm coming. Prog personalized, programmable, predictive, and participatory. Okay. Here's another one. What is the best? I don't see the. Go ahead. I don't see the questions, but that's okay. I'll just read it to you here. What is the best way to encourage okay. your buy-in of these new technologies? I'm a technology coach, and teaching gives a lot of reasons why they don't have time, in quotes, to learn new technology. Well, saying anyone doesn't have time never – I just don't understand that. They don't have the passion. and. My feeling is if you can find something that they're passionate about, one little thing that they like, whether it be AR or whatever, they'll have total buy-in and they will find the time. Um, those of us that are passionate about everything technology, of course, just go, you know, we go in there gangbusters. As a technology coach, you want them to do everything because it's so exciting and it's so great. Oh, sorry, I'm not looking at the screen. Sorry. <laughs> but Because um, I, I can't see myself. I can't see my webcam, so that's why I don't know. Sorry. Um, so I would suggest you uh, just find the one thing that they can glom onto, and then let them develop it in depth, and then they'll be the leader for that thing for their peers, and then you can find some another thing that someone else might be interested in and move it along. Everybody's not going to be interested in all of these, but we want to try to get as many people interested across the board in a lot of different ones to find out what best meets the needs of their, you know, the school, the district, the eight, the grade level, you know, and whatever, the, and the population at the school and the community. Okay, great, thanks. Good, good, good question. Question. said totally agree, by the way, so thank you for that. Uh, here's okay. another question. Do you have a couple of favorite sites for online professional development in technology? Um, I would say no, I don't. Um, I think the best place to get professional development in technology is to become a, is Twitter. Um, mo obviously, blogs are you know long and in depth and very informational. But to find, to follow good people on Twitter who are interested in what you're interested in, and then they will provide you with all kinds of links to whatever. So if you're inter if you're a secondary social studies teacher, you follow, you find the people who you hear your peers or who you just look through a conference, you know, a, a conference book and pick out the names of the people that are featured speakers or highlighted speakers or got good recommendations or whatever and follow them on Twitter and they will soon feed you. And once you get into that group, if if what depending on what you want to learn, like I know that if I need anything about Google, I go, you know, to this person. I ask them that question. I have a lot of people that follow me, but I only follow about 260 people, and every one of them, I know their strength. Now, if, if I want to learn something new, I follow someone else with that strength. If I want to find an administrator, I follow. I look at who Patrick Larkin follows, see what the, the people he follows, because he's an administrator, and then I pull that one of those administrators and follow them for a while and ask them questions or have them feed me. So I think Twitter is, is not, you know, not in-depth professional development, but they can lead you to totally in-depth professional development. So. All right. Here's another question. Do you have any great professional development sites for assistive technologies? Yeah, you're not asking, you have to ask uh, Karen Janowski. I'm not a, a, a Karen J-A-N-O- W S K I. Um, they do have assistive tech uh, chat every Monday or Tuesday night on Twitter. You should definitely attend that. You don't even have to participate. You can just watch. I think it's AT Chat is the hashtag. And if you go to Twitter right now and search AT Chat, you'll find everything that everybody said in the past, whatever, um, as long as Twitter keeps stuff. And uh, but I'm not an assistive technology expert, so I can't give you the answer to that. But Karen Janowski can. Okay, here's one that I'm interested in. What is your latest tech gadget? Um, at uh, 3 a.m. tomorrow, it will be the iPad Pro. <laughs> but um, 
<laughs> 3 a.m. my time. You people on the West Coast only have to stay up till midnight. Yeah. I have to get up. Um, other than that, you know, I'm a uh, every. I mean, I love my Apple Watch. Yeah. Right. Um, it's it's pretty nifty. I am. I like all kind. I like anything gadget. I have my Amazon Echo over there. I can yell at Kong if you want me to do so. Um, that's a very cool thing. If you need holiday present for someone or for yourself, um, hundred seventy nine dollars worth of fun. No question about it. As your Amazon Prime member, you're good. She can read your books out loud to you now too. Interesting. She's so cool. So. Yeah. What else? Um, let's see here. Oh, where can we find uh, this webinar content? Uh, we will be posting this on next Monday at the Brent Haven EDU website. So again, that'll be next Monday at brenthaven.com forward slash EDU. This entire presentation will be posted there for, uh, for anyone that wants to reference that. Any or to, to watch it again because I went too fast. No. Well, I, I was going to tell everyone, pay attention because I do know you talk very quickly and time is precious. So I'm sure everyone got that very quickly as well. So we're all tuned in. It was all good. Uh, let's see. Here's the last question then. What's in your presentation tool bag for ed tech? Physical tool bag? Uh, it doesn't clarify. Presentation is in quotes. So what's in your quotes? Presentation tool bag for EdTech. I don't, I don't, yeah. can you clarify a little bit more? Uh, let's see if we get any more information here in just a sec. Well, like for presenting. Uh, the kinds of things I'm presenting? Upcoming kinds of things. Why don't you touch on that, and if not, maybe we'll get some clarification from whoever the question. Is. Okay. Yeah. So I'm just um, I'm just doing one now on sketch noting. I've been promoting sketch noting for a while. I've been practicing. I'm not very good, um, but I wanted to get a whole presentation together, like why sketch noting, and obviously the research supports that um, you learn things much better if you're if you listen and then visually represent it in a way that's meaningful to you. So anyway, I'm, put, I'm doing that together. I just put together an Adobe one, um, Creativity with the Adobe mobile apps, which was which was fun to do. I'm doing that workshop at FETC. That's a workshop. Um, what else have I been doing? Activators and summarizers, or like, everybody calls them something different, dip stickers or openers and closers or whatever. But I took traditional activators and summarizers and turn them into digital activators and summarizers. So more collaborative, more expansive, easier to do um, than, you know, than some of the activators and summarizers are to do in person. So okay. that's pretty much what I'm con concentrating on right now. Yeah, I have a little bit more details that, to go along with that question. Okay. The person says, I do a lot of technology presentations. I use stuff like SlideShare, PowerPoint, Keynote, etc. What all do you use? Okay. Um, I use the, uh, pretty much exclusively Keynote, although um, I'm trying to uh, to change my style a little bit. I'm not hugely creative. I'm, I can copy anybody. I can, you know, copy anything, but I and I look creative, but I'm not creative. But I'm trying to change my style a little bit <clears throat> to not use necessarily Keynote templates or anything, but I'm trying to. Um, Adam Bello has wonderful slides, and he's my good friend. And you know, he could spend six hours on a slide. Mm -hmm. So I always think, what would Adam do before I create a slide? Now, so now I create all my content ahead of time, and then create the slide. So that, like the sketch noting one is all done in sketch noting. If I'm going to do it, I'm a, I'm going to talk about it. I should be doing it. So that's the kind of thing I, I do. I try not to use any templates um, because. <clears throat> the templates that are I know a lot about how people learn and colors and fonts and all that um, from Linnell Burmark's books and I know that none of them meet those criteria at all. Um, they might be pretty but they don't stick with people or they don't make them feel a certain way or they're confusing to look at. So don't, I know that kind of stuff so I just use it but I just like Keynote the best because it's just I think it's easiest to use. Very good. Okay, there's um, where to go. One more comment. Hang on. Oh, okay. 
Um, here's another one. Maybe two more questions. Here's one more. Look, whoops. Looking ahead to 2017, would you recommend interactive flat panels for classroom presentations instead of the traditional projector and interactive board? Yeah. Let's see. Brent Haven doesn't sell interactive whiteboards, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. I've never been an interactive. I've never been an interactive whiteboard fan from day one um, for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, control and capture was fine. You know, controlling the, the computer from the whiteboard and capturing what you were doing was fine. But no one, very few people took advantage of the very deep vector-based wonderful software that came with all of it. So it was a very expensive control. <laughs> and capture device. Um, I definitely think that um, flat panels could be television sets to go along with the cable, mm -hmm. but flat panels and Apple TV or, you know, I, I just saw today that the um, reflector, right, the thing that projects your Apple to your desktop or is uh, to a desktop is now available to project your iPad or iOS device, uh, Apple computer to the Kindle uh, the Amazon Fire Stick. So these things are all coming together. <clears throat> However, you can get something projected to a monitor and you're not tethered is the way to go. So you can move it around, kids can present from wherever they are in the room, uh, multiple people with Reflector app, multiple people can actually project at the same time. So yes, definitely. The price, you can get two or three of those setups for the one interactive whiteboard setup. So. Very good. Okay, here's, it's really not a question, but it's a comment, and it seems appropriate at this end. Uh, you're very modest. Your Blooming app stuff is the bomb. So I'm not sure who sent that in, but uh, thank you very much for that comment. And at this point, again, yeah, I'm thank you. happy. We had uh, an excellent turnout in terms of people listening in. Just to remind people, again, this will be posted on Monday, and uh, Brent Haven will be back in touch with those of you that have stayed on. But again, thank you very much to both Kathy and all of you who have listened into the webinar. And uh, we'll be offering another webinar probably within the next quarter, realistically around March. So look for it then. And thanks to everyone. Big thanks to Kathy. Thank you very much.